really got to make that huge swing around that what we do and and what we live for is for the for the sake of eternity. And I just started thinking that uh, it, it's just been stirring me that so how many things that we do during uh, just any given day are we actually doing for heaven's sake? And that um, eternity is coming like a freight train at humanity. And the only time that we're going to be able to save souls is while we're here and to help people to find Jesus. And, um, you know, people are, are ripe and ready, as you saw in that, that little video. And um, so I just thought the, the best way to do that is living this life for the next life instead of living this life for this life. Amen? We've got to get our focus back on, on, on we're, what we're doing has eternal purpose. Amen? And, and it, basically what we have to do is we just have to get back to the basics. We just got to get to the basics, stir ourselves up, you know, because we've, there's been different stages in our life and different times in our life where we've been more, maybe more on fire for God. And, and the devil comes and he tries to throw everything he possibly can at us. Distractions. You know, like the, the word of God says, very plain and clear, in this life you will have trouble. How many of you know that that is absolutely true? I don't care if it goes from confusion to torment to physical things, financial things, relationships. In this life we will have trouble because we are not, li this is not heaven. We're not in heaven. And we have outside forces that are constantly coming at us. And um, the Bible says that, God's people perish for lack of knowledge. Well, we're on this side of the planet. On this, on, while we're on this planet, on this side of eternity, none of us are going to know everything. So we have to totally rely on God. We just have to get back to the basics. And the basics are the word and the spirit, prayer, and like we said on Sunday, uh, uh, Christians are in all different phases of their, of their walk. And we know we start with believing, and then we have to go to receiving, and then we have to go to submitting and committing. And I really feel like, and it's kind of funny because everything that happened in the first part of the service after we were worshiping and the words, the tongues, interpretations, and the things that were going on, they all had to do with stepping up a fresh commitment with God. Do you notice, Did you notice that, that it had to do with with seeking God first, that we have to commit to the things of God. Amen? Isn't that what it, so we've just got to take a, it, it's not going to just happen. It's not going to fall off. Uh, it's not going to fall into our lives like avocados falling, ripe avocados fall off trees. I don't know if they, I guess they do get ripe and fall off trees, but, you know, it, it, it's something that we have to pursue. Did you notice that everything in our lives that we have that have, any kind of success to it, or it's something that we pursued, you know? You don't have a job unless you pursued getting a job. And you don't keep a job unless you pursue that job and keep that job. You know, you, marriage, you don't have marriage unless you pursue it, and then in marriage, pursue keeping that marriage. Everything worth having in this life is is worth pursuing. And, and first and foremost, above and beyond all things, we have to pursue God. We have to pursue the Lord, pursue the word, and just make a fresh commitment to the things of God. God is moving, I'm telling you. And um, God is raising up people. I do not want to be on the sidelines watching God using people because I didn't fully commit. We got to, let's fully commit. 100%. <laughs> Amen. All right. Anyways, I'm going to read a scripture. Turn over to Matthew and um, the 16th chapter. And the twenty starting at the twenty first verse, Matthew sixteen and verse twenty one, starting at verse twenty one. It says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. 
Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to him, Peter, get behind me, uh, said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is coming to his, is, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. And that verse, I've been reading that verse over and over because the other day I was, I was just laying on the bed and I wasn't, you know, praying or doing anything super spiritual or anything like that. And, and, and the Lord started to talk to me about some stuff and he started talking about how my life will always be lacking if it's not completely surrendered to God. And so the more I thought about that, I thought, yeah, that's interesting, you know. And then one night we were just sitting watching TV and I started thinking about this verse. So I took this verse out and I started to read it actually from, from verse 24 on where it talks about who, um, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. And then I started thinking about that, and I started meditating on it. You know, when the Bible talks about to meditate, it means to mutter, to recite over and over. And I'll tell you, I, the more I have been doing this, the more I have seen the richness of God in my life, meditating on the Word. and. You know, we talked about that. I, you know, I talked about that last last time I was up here. And um, I just began to read this. And I started reading it over and over and reading it over and over. And I started thinking about how I think somehow we have gotten the wrong idea of how the word works. And we'll read it and we'll, we'll say, oh, yeah, I can read that. And, oh, I can quote that. But the way the word renews our mind is when we meditate on it and drive it down into us because the more I read this over and over the more my life begins to conform to what that says it's not that I just mentally know it it's not that I can just recite it it's that when we take the time to be a disciple which means a disciplined one which means to put down the flesh to put down the things of this world and to put the word of God first when I do that and begin to meditate on any scripture I've been med started meditating a lot lately, and I just, I'll just get a scripture and recite it to myself over and over and over, I'm finding that I thought I knew what renewing my mind was until I began to meditate more. And when I began to meditate on this, I began to realize that when we recite the word to ourselves, meditate means to mutter and to say over and over to yourself, to ponder it. And the more I started doing that, when I started doing this, I started to realize, you know what? I have to allow the word of God to do its work. We always say, oh, the word is working or the word works or, you know, whatever. But do we ever really let the word work? And to really let the word work means we have to take that word and we have to meditate on it and think about it and repeat it and recite it. And what happens is when we do that, the way this says begins to become the way we think. It's not just what we think we think. It actually changes the way we think. And it works kind of like a Tetris game. Now, even though I'm terrible at Tetris, but she's really good at it. Did you ever notice how when, or that other game, what's the game you play? The game Candy Crush or whatever. But you move one piece, and all of a sudden it changes the landscape of the whole board. You know what I'm talking about, right? Well, meditating on the Word of God, we might be meditating on this scripture here. And this is what I've been meditating on because I thought, God, I want to not live this life for myself. I want to live this for you. I don't want to be the person who, who, who tries to save his life. I want to be the person to lose his life. But I started thinking, in my own power, I can't make myself do that. Even though I know it says it in the Word, but in my own ability, I can't make myself do it. But then I began to realize 
If we truly put the word of God to work and meditate on the word, like it says, if we meditate in the word, we'll make our way prosperous and successful. If we truly do that and become disciples, it says go make disciples of all nations and purpose to put it into our mouths and say it and meditate on it, it begins to change the way we actually think. And the way we look at everything starts to change through the light of the word of God. We're not thinking the way we used to. We think, oh, you know, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of the word so that you may test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. But we never take the time to renew our mind. And it takes time to renew your mind. It took a long time to get you to where you are today and all the input that's been put in. But to purposely meditate on the word starts changing every single thing because what it does, it's like a Tetris game or a, or a Candy Crush or whatever, that all of a sudden you blow up one of those bombs and it takes out all those pieces. What else happens? All the other pieces rearrange. When the word of God renews our mind in one area, it's like that bomb going off and all the other pieces in our life start realigning to something brand new, which is God's plan and God's purpose, and God's way of living and being right. You know, that's what it says. It says in Matthew 6, 33, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his way of doing and being right, and all these things will be added unto us. And if we take the time, and it's on us, it's not on God. God has given us his word. This word is filled with the power of God. This word will never change. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away. This word will never pass away. This word is what holds the universe together and keeps the sea where it is and the land where it is. Actually, this word holds all the animals and people together. It holds everything together. It causes us to live. It changed our lives when we received Jesus, the living word. But we have to be disciplined enough to take this word and put, I was going to put this up on Instagram and say, I got a meditation for everybody to, to do. And it's just these verses right here. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. And read it to yourself over and over and over and recite it and think about it and lay in your bed. The Bible talks about David said, I lay on the bed at night and I think of your word. And just put that in and watch. Watch what will happen. Pretty soon, we think, oh, I really want to have a more consecrated life to God. Pretty soon, because the word of God actually starts to work, that your life will consecrate to the will of God. Because the word of God is what makes the change. We can't make any changes. I can't make a change. I've been a Christian for how many years? 36 years. I can't make any changes on my own. But the word of God can change everything. Isn't that awesome? And it's not even hard. All it takes is dedication and commitment on our part. Hey, we dedicate and commit to stuff all the time. I do it. If I want to learn something, I'm, I'm trying to learn this photo, photo uh, editing program, this video editing program. Man, it takes a little bit of dedication, but I figured it out. It took me a couple days. But if we use the word of God the way it's intended to be used, the Bible says that a farmer goes out and he sows the seed. And it says, he goes to sleep, he wakes up night and day. He says he has no idea how that word, how that seed is growing. But the seed grows. We plant the word in us. We keep putting the word in us. We keep putting the word in us. We meditate, 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 and become a disciple. What happens is we change the way we think, and we're no longer conformed to the pattern of this world. We are transformed by the renewal of our mind, and we do know what the will of God is, and that's it. It's tested and approved, and it changes our lives. You know, the church right now, I said this the other day, the church right now is chasing, more than ever, is chasing after feelings. Oh, give me a feeling. And you jump from one feeling to another, everybody's jumping from this feeling, and then it's feathers, and then it's rocks, and then it's jewels, and whatever. And, and gold dust. And, and it's bouncing around looking for the next thing. But the word of God is the foundation that holds to that we can, it's the only thing that we can build our lives on. We're not going to build it on a feather. The stage is out of the churches and bring altars back in. 
and and um, you know the church has made a lot of curves and a lot of gone a lot of directions and done a lot of things, but God's word is true and it absolutely until the last thing that God wrote in this book comes to pass, it 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 will not be altered. Uh, it will not be altered by man because God knows the beginning to the end. And what he said is absolutely going to happen. It's up to us as individuals whether we want to be a part of it or not. Amen. And just stir our hunger for the things of God. It's just the basics. It's always going to be the basics, the word and prayer. Just walking with God, getting to know his voice. I remember um, I, I've told you the story one time that when Rolf Wilker, Wilkerson was at our house for dinner and he was getting ready to leave, and um, the power of God, he stood up, and I was coming down the stairs. The power of God just was on him. And when I got to the bottom of the stairs, I thought, oh, something's get, getting ready to happen in the Holy Ghost. And he just said, he said, the ministry is great. And I thought, you know, here's a man that had 17,000 members in his church. First mega church, I think, in the U.S. Had the start of the big Jesus movement in California. And he just said, um, <clears throat> he said, hold my hands. And he said, he said, repeat this after me. And I mean, I was just, uh, the power of God was so strong. And I just, he said, you know, the ministry is great. And then he adds to it, it's going to cost me everything and I will pay the price. And so just recently, I just felt like, you know, I'm, I'm about, <laughs> it cost me everything. <laughs> I was like, okay. I was like, Lord, I just feel like there's nothing less. There's just nothing left. And he said, what part of everything didn't you understand? It's going to cost us everything. And we just have to put, find out what, what value we put on anything in this life. Is it more than God? Is it more than the kingdom? Is it more than Jesus and the price that he paid for our lives? The Bible says very clearly, <clears throat> we don't even belong to ourselves. We belong to him because he paid the price for us. Amen. Hallelujah. So <clears throat> um, my prayer is that we be stirred up in the place of prayer. My prayer is that we be, and sometimes I just pray, Lord, I just, I'll just pray in the spirit for, for an hour, two hours, just praying, you know, God, stir us up, stir us up, Lord, help us, help us, help us to have that inspiration and that fire and that zeal like we've done in different days. And and I do really believe, you know, if I go through just my life and see where different times where it got, it got dull, and you know, obviously because of, because of me, but God would come back and blow a fresh wind in. I'm my prayer is that a fresh wind of God would blow in this region, and people will get hungry for the things of God, hungry for the things of this world, and they'll be done being entertained done with the smoke in the mirrors, done with all of it, and they just want God and his word and holiness. There's, if we're going to have a move of God, there has to be a move of holiness. It can't, you know, there, there might be fun and games, <laughs> rolling and laughing, but if holiness does not move with that, where whatever part of the move that people are involved in, if there isn't holiness attached to it, it's not God. Because God is holy. Amen. It'll cause people to consecrate their lives, to stop sinning, and and not and and get rid of the stupid grace message that oh we can just live any way because of God's grace. No, God's grace helps us in a time of need, so that we will do the right thing. Amen.